guys. Uh, <clears throat> but if we look at this scripture here, guys, uh, it talks about Jesus talking concerning these scribes, these truth bearers, and something they would do. They go into the treasury or the a uh, householder would then bring out uh, from the treasure things that are new and old. And one thing I love about the, the scriptures, the Bible, guys, it's all good. Do you guys know that? Sometimes uh, I've bumped into a Christian. They just want nothing to do with the Old Testament. You know, well, that's for the Jews. That's old. That's not for us. And it's just like, let me prove it for a second. I want you to raise your hand if you enjoy the Old Testament more than the New Testament. Raise your hand. Okay, there's a good handful. Some of you guys are like, I don't know, it's all good. I love the Old Testament. I always have. It's rich, okay? There's so much there for us as believers to learn. And as you guys are going to see this morning as we begin in the beginning, Genesis is foundational to who we are as Christians and what we believe. And if we don't have this foundation, we would be a mess And the reason why we do see people who are a mess, even within the church, is because they haven't studied and haven't found uh, sure footing upon the foundations of our faith, which really are found um, in the book of Genesis. So this morning, you guys ready to jump in? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. We pray and ask in your name, Jesus, uh, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd give us a firm foundation in which to stand. And we know it's you, Jesus, and it's your word. You are the word. You're the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us full of truth and grace. And we want to know that truth and we want to grow in that grace today. So please, we're asking in your name, God, meet with each and every one of us and uh, just bless the teaching of this book. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. So here this morning, we're going to consider Genesis and just an intro to it. Um, I want you guys to catch and understand when we consider Genesis together. I mean, on the the first book of Moses called Genesis, that's what the title of my Bible uh, says. But the books of Moses uh, are referred to, how many of you guys have heard of the Pentateuch before? Pentateuch simply means the first five or five books, uh, five-fold book. Uh, The Jewish people refer to the first five books of the Bible as the Torah, that's right, okay, uh, referring to the law. So we have the Jewish people. These are their writings. Moses was a Jew, right? Uh, so we have the Pentateuch. In the first book of the Pentateuch, they call uh, Bereshith, which literally means in the beginning, okay? So Genesis is a book of beginnings. And think about it, guys. We're going to see the beginning of time, of creation, beginning of uh, man, okay, and their fall, okay, when that began. Uh, A lot of firsts come up, a lot of beginnings we see as you study the book of Genesis. So we know of the name, the name Genesis means creation or generation uh, because it gives an account of the origin of all things. So it's the beginning. Now, to simplify for you guys, Um, We see here, uh, Pentateuch, Torah, and then I want to take a look with you guys at uh, a division that we see as we look at the book of Genesis. We see in chapters 1 to 11, there's a focus, and that focus is on four events. We have creation, the fall, the flood, and then we'll look at the tower. And then the rest of the book from chapters 12 to 50 focus on four key people. And those people, as you know, are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, I know of them, okay? And then there's Joseph. And Joseph is a huge chunk of Genesis, and it will be fun to get into his life. Now, as we consider the authorship of uh, the book of Genesis, uh, we know it's Moses, okay? He may have uh, made use of documents that already existed and just compiled and put together. We weren't there. We don't know. Maybe there were oral traditions that were handed down, and he ended up penning those things. But either way, however Moses got the info 
The one who created all things guided Moses as he wrote. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? I'm so glad you guys asked. Take a look here with me at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Peter says this, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by a prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that's how you guys have the 66 books that you hold in this one book in your hand right now. Okay, These men who authored these books were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Pretty cool, huh? Um, and we... Uh, I would love to get into why we know that's true. But do you guys who've studied the scriptures, just how harmonious it is? I mean, 66 different books, and they all speak to the same truth, that God was going to come and save this world. I mean, it is beautiful. There's harmony there. I'm sorry, you can't get 66 books to say the same thing. It's just impossible, unless there is really one author, the Holy Spirit, inspiring these guys to be all on the same page. Some of you guys grew up Catholic or have a pa Catholic pa background. If you throw in the apocrypha, like the extra 13 books they got, do you guys know that we have contradictions and things don't flow anymore? I mean, just a handful of books that people would really regard as being, you know, religious in nature and biblical in nature, but you add any one of those 13 books, it doesn't fit anymore. It doesn't work, and there's a reason why, guys, okay? The Bible, inspired by God. So considering the scriptures together, um, can we trust or can we literally take the first 11 chapters of Genesis um, to be true. Just take it for what it says. How many of you guys believe that we can take the word of God literally? All right, for you guys who don't, I'm so glad you're here this morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, I hear from people all the time, after all, you know, you Bible thumper, the Bible isn't a science book, you know? Well, why does everything have to be about science? It, do you guys know the Bible really isn't a science book? It contains science, but God didn't author it for it to be a science book. If he wanted to do that, he would have done that. You know, but the thing that is so cool, that be, how many of you guys have heard that from people before? But yeah, that just comes up more than it needs to. I'm just like, but I don't, I, I want to understand where unbelievers are coming from. But the thing that is so cool about the Bible, especially set apart from other religious books that there are in the world, it steers clear of scientific error. If anything, science and scientists have been wrong through the ages. The Bible's always right. Okay, God knows what's up because he's the one who created it and he knows how it works. Do you guys get that? Okay, when Jeremiah the prophet says, hey, the stars that we have, you can't number them. Okay, they're pretty awesome. It's the multitude of the sand of the sea. Okay, there are a whole lot of stars out there. No, there's not. Did you guys know that there were a lot of famous scientists that actually tried counting the stars? Oh, they charted them and they argued with one another. You're wrong. I found a few more. You know, how? Well, if your chart was right, you would know. We had all this science telling us that there were 1,600, 1,500, 1,200. No, you counted way too many. There's only 1,100. They fought and argued about it. But I love in 1608, this dude Galileo made this thing called a telescope, and he put it up towards the heavens. And guess what happened, guys? Oh, mind blown! The Bible's actually right. It says we can't count the stars, and here we thought we could count it. Us scientists thought we knew better than the Bible. And that's what happens. That's just one example. But this happens all the time, guys. Science is catching up with what the Word of God says. I love that. I love that. And it steers clear from all scientific error. Unlike some other books. Okay, Do you guys know that the Muslim world, um, Allah spoke of the time when the sun, it sets every evening in a muddy spring. Do you guys know that to be true? The Bible doesn't have errors like that. It doesn't <laughs> go to some muddy spring every evening. Okay, Alexander the Great, a man, traveled, and he found the setting place of the sun. 
I, I'm sorry, that's wrong. If I, if I found error like that in the Bible, you know what I would do with the Bible? Pfft, forget it. <laughs> okay, how can, I get, how can I trust your word, God, if it's not true? But the Bible doesn't do that. In Psalm 19.6, this is all side note. You can jot it down. We'll get into more creation science stuff next week. But it's just fun to consider. Psalm 19.6, and you guys know it? King David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, as we just read, right? An author of the Bible, right in, in a psalm, talks about the sun. And it's rising from one end of heaven to the other, okay? And the sun is on a circuit, we're told. Well, wait a minute. Don't you know, we scientists know that the sun is stationary. It's not moving. We move around the sun. It's stationary. The Bible's wrong again. No, King David was right, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, because now we have these satellites that we can actually uh, track. The sun does move at 600,000 miles per hour. So, hmm, who's right again? God. The Word of God. Okay? And today, guys, we're teaching our kids across the street that nothing blew up, and as a result of evolution, that's why we're here today. Nothing blew up. That's the great, I don't even want to call that a theory. That's just stupidity. But that's what we're teaching people. God's never wrong. I could go on. We need to get into, it's, it's reliable. That's what I want you guys to get. Because even today within the church, we have people who will not trust the Bible, that it is literal. You don't have to agree with me, but I believe every word of the Bible. Starting in Genesis 1. One, You see, many writers on Genesis have emphasized that it's allegory. They take an allegorical approach to the first 11 chapters of Genesis, that Adam was not really a real person, not a real man, but he was rather a symbolic rep- representation of all of mankind. And the fall was not actually an act of disobedience, but, uh, you know, by a first man and a first woman, but rather it's a figurative expression of the common experience of all people. Guys, and this is taught in so many of our seminaries today. People who are going to prepare to be ministers, this is what they're being taught. I trust the word of God, and I'm not going to turn my back on it, guys, and I don't want you to either. I want to trust, because if I can't trust God's word in the beginning of the Bible, how am I going to trust the gospel when it comes up in the scriptures? Without the gospel, we have no hope. There is no truth. Oh, man. There's so much going through my head right now. You know, my sonny went to, or my sonny, my wife, sonny, uh, she went to one of our state schools, and when she was there, she went down in Oshkosh. Um, the biology students down there, guys. Um, intelligent design. Even though they were being taught atheistic beliefs, theories in their classes, as they were looking just at observable science, man, <laughs> intelligent design is near or needed here. In the science that we're observing, everything's pointing to a newer creation. This millions and millions of years thing's just not fitting. And that's what they're seeing. When we come to the scriptures and we see God's word, are we going to twist it to fit what we think, our opinions, our presuppositions, or are we going to come and just say, all right, God, let every man be a liar and you be true. I'm going to believe your word. I'm going to trust it. One thing that I love, because people argue, okay, you guys can pick up commentaries, you can read article after article on why we should approach, you know, Genesis allegorically. I don't care what people say. I think you guys know that. I don't care. What does God say? What does Jesus say? I want you guys to look up on the screen here with me. Jesus referred to people and events in Genesis as historical. He tells us in Matthew 19, verses 4, 5, and 6, haven't you read? He replied, so this is Jesus speaking. Have you not read? Literally, 
read Genesis that in the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Okay, this is our Lord and Savior. God himself saying, hey, have you not read Genesis? Do you not know that there was a literal creation and that when God created human beings, it was a man and a woman? And that's the way he designed things to be. And those two are to be married, united as one, okay? We also see another passage of Scripture I'd like to look at in Matthew 24, Jesus speaking to the same idea. He says, as it was in the days of Noah. Well, there was no literal flood. That didn't really happen. Yes, it did. Why? Because Jesus said it did, okay? The Word of God said it did. And he says here, So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So aren't you guys thankful that Jesus spoke plainly about these things? He's like, don't mess with my word. Okay? Genesis is legit. And he should know because he's God. And he was the only one that was there in the beginning. So the New Testament writers did the same thing that Jesus did. Um, I'm going to be referring to a guy by the name of Henry Morris as we go through Genesis often. Because this beautiful book of 600 plus pages um, is a phenomenal commentary on the book of Genesis. So if you guys really want to dig it, I would encourage you to grab a hold of the Genesis record. And one of the coolest things that's in this entire, well, it's really good, but towards the end, um, I had the page number, uh, 677. I won't turn there. Well, I will turn there. It's the appendix here, and they have over 200 references and allusions from the New Testament alone to the book of Genesis. So the New Testament writers laid claim to know (laughs) Genesis is literal. We're going to quote it. We're going to speak to it often in our writings because we believe it's legit. It is literal. I love that. So if you really want to study and dig in, there's so many scriptures on that. So an allegorical approach should be rejected by anybody that's serious about studying the word of God. That's what I think. If you don't agree with me, that's great. I'd love to have coffee with you and talk at length about it. Um, But... Yeah, it's just a bummer that there's these so-called scholars out there today that take this approach when the Bible itself, the apostles, and Jesus himself didn't. Do these scholars know better than them? I don't think so, okay? Um, Some portions I want us to note, guys, when we consider Genesis, it should be treated as types in the New Testament, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, The first Adam, you guys remember reading about that in Corinthians? Hey, let me turn there real quick. Um, It's a contrasting type. The first Adam to the second Adam. Read with me here in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. It says, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And then in verse 45 of that chapter, so it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam a living spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and then after that, the spiritual. The first man was of dust of the earth, and the second man from heaven. So here, guys, we see a type, okay? And we're going to see a lot of that as we go through the book of Genesis. Things like this are going to come up, and the best way to really um, study the scriptures, okay, is allow the scriptures, guys, to define, to teach us, other scripture because again it's 66 different books right and we can learn and pull from all of them to bring home different things that the word of god speaks to and is teaching us another one i'd love to share with you guys is in romans chapter uh, 5 verses uh, 12 it says therefore just as sin entered the world through one man that would have been adam and death through sin and this was the way of death came to all men because all sinned and then verse 15 says but the gift 
is not like the trespass. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So, however, guys, there are many uh, you know, biblical types in contrast with allegories, but it depends on the historical credibility of their sources. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, one thing that I love that we're doing here at Freedom Fellowship is our children's ministry. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but 90% of people come to Christ before they're 18. That's just a reality. Why do we see so many church kids today grow up in the church and end up walking away from their faith? What happened? Well, they were given some cute Bible stories growing up. They were never really taught the Word of God. Here at Freedom, we've been doing for many years now a Bible curriculum called Answers. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with the ministry Answers in Genesis? Awesome! They have the uh, Creation Museum. Uh, a few months ago, I took my kids and my wife. We all went down to the creation, uh, or sorry, the, the Ark Encounter, which is also down there in Kentucky, and walked through a whole size Noah Ark size. I got pictures, which we'll be sharing in a few weeks when we get into the flood with you guys. Uh, but what I love about this curriculum that we're doing with our kids, okay, they're learning the Bible, okay? In four years, they're going to go through the whole of Scripture, and they're going to be hitting on a lot of things that you don't find in regular children's curriculum. And a lot of it, it's not, hey, here's a story that you should know as a Christian. But, hey, we're going to approach it apologetically. How do we know this story is true? How can we actually trust and believe the word of God? They're actually given the tools that it's not just a blind faith. That, hey, when I go off to university someday and I'm challenged by this world and the many lies that are out there, I'm going to be able to stand, okay? Because I know that the word of God is sure, that it is true, that it is factual. I can actually have intelligent conversations with people and understand where the world's coming from and what my biblical worldview is and why I have it. So I love that our kids at a young age are learning the basics. And really the foundation of this entire curriculum goes back to Genesis, they're always referring back to the first 11 chapters just being uh, so important to our faith and where we stand. So again, guys, I think one of the biggest ministries we have as a church is to our kids, okay? Kids' church ministry is huge. I want to encourage you guys to be praying for our kids on a regular basis. I want to encourage you guys to get involved, serve them, okay? Well, how does discipleship work? Well, you disciple somebody, okay? Let me tell you what. There's kids all around us. Did you guys hear me mention before there's hundreds of kids across the street that are being lied to? Wow, there's a mission field right there, you know? And how cool if we're teaching our kids the truth that they actually can have uh, dialogue, real conversations with their friends. Because let me tell you what, my heart breaks hearing about how many kids walk away from the faith, from the church, because they end up getting questioned about their faith. We're told as believers that we need to be ready to give a defense for our faith in Christ. When anybody asks, we need to be ready. And let me tell you what, if Satan's after our kids, our kids need to know the truth. So I want to encourage you guys, especially you mom and dads, you know, it's great that we're doing this at church, but this needs to be done in the home, okay? It is not our responsibility here at Freedom Fellowship to teach your kids to live their spiritual life. That is on you. Mom and dad, you are called to train your kids in the ways of the Lord. Okay, we are a tool. We are a help. We want to be a blessing and come alongside you in that. But it really falls on mom and dads. That's your job. And let me tell you what, the biggest thing that you can be for your kids is an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. You truly follow Jesus. You don't play church on Sunday or with your Christian friends. They see. Our kids are not dumb. <laughs> they know the truth. You love Jesus. You follow him. They need to see that. Be real in your life. Because they're watching, guys. They know. Anyways, moving on. Let's uh, talk just for a moment about some other Old Testament types. For a second, um, just to define this for you and I, a type may be said of a person or an object, an event, uh, or some institution 
uh, divinely adapted to represent a uh, spiritual truth or reality. Um, it's a prefigure of some person or a truth uh, that's going to be revealed later. And this is what we find in the Old Testament all over. And that's why it's so cool. And that's why I love reading the Old Testament, knowing the New Testament. It's just like, whoa, this fits together. This is so cool, right? Also, there's an anti-type out there, which is a person or event that is a foreshadowed by or identified with earlier symbol or type. If you guys look up here with me at Romans chapter 15, I love this scripture. It says Romans 5, but it's actually Romans 15. Uh, for everything that was written in the past, so the Old Testament, it's written to teach us. So that through the endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Do we need a little hope today? Are things a little hopeless out there? Well, according to the word of God, we're going to find through the scripture endurance and encouragement that we might have hope. It's in his word that we find hope. And I see so many today grasping, trying to find hope in other things, other people. We can't do it. God says you're going to find hope through the scriptures. And that's the beauty for you and I as believers, guys. We spend time searching and studying the word of God. Because, wow, this is true. This is right. You are good. There is a hope that is sure, that is real. This isn't wishful thinking. Okay, it is you, God. You are our hope. You alone are our Savior. This is what the world needs. On Wednesday night, I briefly got to talk with our brother Wes. He's been digging into the scriptures concerning hope. I don't know if you guys have been following me on Facebook. I've been throwing out scriptures lately on hope. God's been doing the same thing in my own heart. Digging into the word of God. Here is more truth. Here is encouragement. Here is big picture thing. And the hope is being found from the word of God, guys. And we talked briefly about it. It was so cool because it all came back to scriptures we've been reading. And I'm looking forward to getting coffee with him. And I know it's going to be a two or three hour sit down conversation because there's so much in the word of God in regards to hope that we have as believers so I want to encourage you guys, even the Old Testament, as we're told right here, is written for what? Our encouragement, right? For endurance. How many of you guys desire to fight the good fight of faith, to finish well? I sure do. Well, according to the scripture, we're going to find some endurance to do it. Where? It's through the word of God. This is how we're going to do it, guys. That's why we take the word of God serious here at Freedom. This is why we're not going to turn our back on it. Yeah, I would say this last week has been one of the craziest weeks in the nation in which I live. And it would be very easy for me to get up here and talk to you guys this morning about what I think about it, what the Bible has to say about it. But I believe that when we steadily trust the Lord and just keep going through, patiently through the word of God, that we're going to be able to stand and endure and find encouragement and hope that when this craziness does happen, we're not going to be tossed to and fro. That these false teachers that are arising, who are using the word of God for their own agendas to grab a following, that we're not going to be tossed because of what's going on around us because we are already grounded in the truth. We should be thriving as believers no matter what this world throws our way, no matter what's down the pike. Had a conversation this last week with a brother who thinks that the church is going to be closing its doors and we're going to go to home churches. Praise God if that happens. Is that going to change your life as a believer? I sure hope not. I just hope it opens up more ministry opportunity because if something like that happened, I hope that you guys are grounded in the word of God that, hey, we're doing Bible study in our home today. Let's invite our neighbors because they're going to be what? Looking for hope because things are pretty darn hopeless and we have the hope to share we have the word of God. Isn't that cool? I love it. Anyways, sorry for all the side notes. I'm not supposed to be preaching this morning. I am teaching. So let's consider this for a second. Some principles as we approach Genesis in the Bible as a whole when it comes to interpretation 
of it. I need you guys to understand that no doctrine, no teaching that we find in the Bible or theory should ever be built upon a type or types independently of direct teaching elsewhere in the scriptures. I see this happening today in the church. Okay, There are many groups out there on our social media platforms, a lot of ministries that are doing this, and we need to be careful. You see, types are meant to illustrate truth, not to formulate that truth. So, types, these illustrated truths, without clear scripture teaching, guys, elsewhere, a type only um, is a, it has authority of that of an allegory, okay? We also need to make connections between type and anti-types that should be pressed, uh, should not be pressed to any extremes. I'm amazed. How many of you guys enjoy podcasts, like listening to sermons and teachings online? I do that all the time. And I'll be upfront with you guys. I listen to some people who should not be teaching the Bible whatsoever. They're, they're nuts. They're crazy. Um, but every once in a while, knowing the truth, they dig into things that they shouldn't be doing. They do this. They're pulling things out and making off of types, making this huge doctrine in writing books off of this one scripture which doesn't actually mean what they're talking about i've grown up in it i've seen a lot of this with the prophetic word being spoken today a lot of these uh movements do the exact same thing and i'm just like all right where's the discernment in the church you can't go and pull out these scriptures and then make it this whole big thing when it's not actually what the bible's talking about there we got to be very careful especially if it's not taught somewhere else okay we got to be very careful about that. So we need to have that understanding. Be very careful when you approach the scripture in that way. Anyways, moving on. Um, you guys ready to get into Genesis? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> what is this scripture? First Corinthians? Oh, that's another type. We're past this. I'm sorry. We're moving on. Guys at home, I love you. You guys, you're so awesome. Um, Genesis 1 1. You guys open there? First verse in the Bible, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God. Think about that for a minute. In the beginning, so many questions come around this statement. And this is one of the most unique scriptures in all of the Bible. Um, this just popped in my head, so I'm going to share it. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with a brother by the name of Chuck Missler? He's gone home to be with Jesus Christ. Uh, I actually got to sit down with him and have lunch. Um, neat brother. Uh, I enjoy, he had a lot of different, um, you know, prophetic updates, different things, that type of ministry. But what I enjoyed the most about Chuck Missler was his verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Bible. So if you guys can get a hold of any of his old teachings from K-House or anything, just grab his Bible teaching. Some of it is phenomenal. But he's kind of a super nerdy, genius kind of guy. Um, and I love that about him because he would just unpack and share things like, you got to be kidding, dude. Like, I don't even understand how that would work. But I remember him one time speaking about Genesis chapter 1. Okay, we know that in the world today, we have many different translations of the Bible, right? Many different languages out there, okay? And languages would make up a lot of different sentences and a lot of different uh, translations would, you know, put Genesis 1-1 in their own language, dialect, whatever. Um, they had submitted to Harvard. Um, they got supercomputers. This was years ago now. Their, their computer probably could be on here now. <laughs> but years ago, they had these supercomputers that were around. And they submitted Put together any complete sentence you want. It can be whatever you want in any language that you want. And do you guys know that in the original Hebrew, and even in our own you know, English alphabet, letters have numeric values. Do you guys know that? In a numeric value that we are going to see a lot of as we study the Bible is the number seven. Okay, seven days of creation, which we're going to get into the next time we're into Genesis. Um, the number seven comes up a lot, and especially in Hebrew. 
And they submitted. And he's like, any sentence you want that comes up with more numerical values of the number seven. Okay, so the letters it ha- uh, has itself, multiples of it. I want you to submit that and compare it to Genesis 1.1. Okay, well, every known language, any sentence you want to put together, there is no known sentence that has more numerical value of the number seven, completeness, which is the number seven. That's what it means, complete. Okay then the original Hebrew verse of Genesis 1.1, this one sentence, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. There are so many numerical seven values of that one sentence in the Hebrew than any other completed sentence known to mankind. It's crazy. Uh, The way Chuck said it was way cooler. (laughs) But I just keep, I don't know why that even popped in my mind, but it just blows me away because the word of God is supernatural, which we'll get into in a little bit here. Um, But in the beginning, okay, uh, let's consider this for a second. This is how the Bible begins. And literally, at commencement of time, that's what it's talking about, when all time began. So the space-time continuum of all created things since that time, okay, it's actually a byproduct of matter and space and is itself, you know, relative Thank you, Mr. Albert Einstein, right? Okay, that begins to make sense. What? This actually works? We can have some understanding around this? You see, guys, the space-time, the central concept in the theory of relativity, it replaces the earlier concepts that people had of space and then time being separate, okay? Absolute different entities. But space and time, the time you know, is relative to the observer, is what Einstein laid out. So when we read in the Bible about, hey, there was an observable time, space, in the beginning, okay? So there's also out there that unified field theory in physics, a theory that proposes to unify the four known interactions out there, or forces, the strong the electromagnetic, the weak, gravitational forces that we all have, all those things play in to this in attempts to develop a unified field theory of of being grounded in belief of all physical phenomena should ultimately be explainable by some underlining unity. And that comes back to in the beginning, there was a time, a space, okay? took place i love what hebrews you guys can check this out on the screen the author begins his book by saying this in the past god spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe the son is, it is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And then one more scripture from Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. It says, And he, speaking of Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things consist. I think that's pretty darn cool. Because people can't figure out, scientists don't understand how everything is held together. We can break down and we can see all the different parts, okay? But what actually holds that all together? According to God, he's the one that holds it all together. Wow. So even our being, our existence, somebody brought that all together, created that. And who is that? Well, it's God. It's God. So, Elohim. You guys can write that in your Bibles if you want. That is the word here that is used in Genesis 1.1. How many of you guys have heard the name Elohim before? Quite a few of you guys. That's good. So, it's a word itself. Is re- it's in a plural form, which I think is fascinating. Think about that for a second. Um, it could be translated God's here but however it's used grammatically in a singular context and that's how we see it used over 2300 other times in the bible it's always used 
this way. But the thing that it's really cool when it's used, it's always referring to God, the creator, and it's really stressing his majesty and his omniscience. Thus, when we consider God Elohim as a plural name, okay, with a singular meaning, it's suggesting, guys, that God is one, yet more than one. This doesn't explicitly explain the Trinity or teach it, but it provides the basis for later revelation that we study in the scriptures. I, is that cool to you guys? Okay, I know I'm nerding a little bit, but like stuff like this is so cool. Elohim, plural, one God, creator, all-powerful, Elohim, and it's used all over the scriptures. It's so cool. But when we think about God, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I miss you guys online. I'm back. You guys, uh, when we look at God and consider him, the thought, when we just throw out God, there's a lot of baggage that sometimes comes with the idea of God. Okay, um, God, okay, we, we've been talking science a little bit. A lot of people have a hard time with the concept of God or God because it denies science. At least that's what they think. They bring that baggage with them. Well, I can do no, don't talk to me about this gospel, about this God who came to earth and died on a cross 2,000 years ago, okay? That doesn't fit my science, and I've been taught this my entire life. And that's why it's good to give a defense for our faith. That's why it's good to know how to blow evolution out of the water. First of all, I like saying, you might have heard me say this before, nothing blew up and that's how we came to I mean, just start at the basic. I mean, that's just ridiculous, okay? And you can start asking people questions why they believe foolishness. Anyways, um, but there's a lot of times when we come to the scriptures, we consider God, there's baggage that comes. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a conversation just about how you know, in regards to God, how God is so oppressive to women. That was the conversation I ended up having. And do you guys understand when this type of baggage comes in, it really has nothing to do with God. It's religion. That's the problem. It's religion. Do you guys read the same Gospels I read? Okay. What did Jesus come with? A new religion? <laughs> no. He came to set the record right. I think about him showing up in John chapter 4. You remember when we met with that woman at the well? Man, if you were a Jew talking to that type of woman, you were considered all, you're, you're going, you're going to fire hell. That, because you did that, you're going to hell. That's what they believed. But Jesus came. Truth came. God came, and he set the record straight, guys. Isn't God about relationship? Did he not come to save us that we could be born again and become a part of his family? That's what it's about, guys. That's our Jesus. And I hate this religious baggage that we deal with. And we have to deal with it and talk about it because it's in our lives. It's within the churches. And it needs to be addressed, guys. You know, it's religion that put Jesus on the cross. Do you guys understand that? He came to die for the sins of the world, but it was religion that put him upon the cross. I love how John um, defined God. Are you guys familiar with First John 4? Um, is it 18? I think it's 18. God is love. Think about that for a second. God is love. Isn't that cool to think about? I mean, that's the simplest. I mean, in the beginning, God. How do we define him? Who is he? God. Think about it, guys. We're told in John 14, 19, Jesus was speaking. He said, hey, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, has seen God. Why? Because Jesus is God. Okay? Okay. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all one, okay? You've seen the Father, or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he said. And then we're told in Colossians 1.15 that Jesus is the express image of God, right? Ekon, the Greek word, portrait. In other words, Jesus is the visible God, 
the one who we read earlier in Colossians holds all things together. All things were created through him who Jesus, who is the creator? Well, it's God. Yeah, Jesus is God. He came. We beheld him full of grace and truth. Okay, God, you want to know what God looks like, who he is? Read the Gospels. Get to know Jesus. Come into a relationship with him. Guys, it's so crazy. So many people are groping in the dark trying to grasp who God is. Okay? He's some goody, two-shoes, you know, moral judge out there. A lot of fundamental Christianity, that's all they want to box God into. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. God's, <laughs> you guys want to turn to 1 Corinthians? I met with Brian. Brian said he loves the love chapter in the Bible. How many of you guys love 1 Corinthians 13? How many of you guys, he, he was telling me how when he reads 1 Corinthians 13, how it speaks to him in different ways at different times. Isn't that the cool thing about the Word of God? It's living and powerful. What you're hearing today and as we're studying the beginning of Genesis, you may study this tomorrow and God may reveal something radically different. Still true. Nothing's changed. But that's what the Word of God does. So 1 Corinthians 13. You guys are all familiar with the love chapter because you've been at a wedding. <laughs> right? Uh, let's jump down to verse 4. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but enjoys or rejoices in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Now, God is love. Go back to verse 4 with me. Jesus is God. Jesus suffers long. Is that true? Wow. And Jesus is kind? Yeah. What, Jesus does not envy? Jesus does not parade himself? He's not puffed up? He does not behave rudely? He doesn't seek his own? He's not provoked? He thinks no evil? He does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth? Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things? Jesus never fails? Wow, guys. The religious baggage that we bring into our understanding of who God is. We need to knock it off. I think about those out there who believe God to be some cosmic force, okay, um, and not really a person at all. That's what Buddhists believe. That's their concept of God, okay? Some think he's a divine spark in every living thing. That's a Hindu mindset of God. We're all gods. He's within us all. Okay? Some out there think he's a non-relational warrior. Certain factions within Islam, that's all they look at Allah as, God. He's a figment of your imagination. He comfort, he's a comforting delusion when you feel weak. That's what the atheists believe about God. If you guys ever come across an atheist who really hates God, you got to tell them they're not an atheist. You can't hate somebody if you don't believe it. Anyways, only a fool says in their heart there's no God. They're a little confused. So what do we do? We pray and we share the love of God with them. So how do you know that this is true? I'm glad you guys asked. I want to consider in our time as we close this morning just some classical arguments that are out there for the existence of God. How many of you guys have seen God? You probably would have died. No one can see God and live, right? That's what the Bible tells us. Um, but we definitely see the effects of God. I know him. I've been born again in the spirit of God. He lives within me. I know that's true. I can share many, many different testimonies to that. Um, but the thing when it comes to God, you guys know that there's a universal belief of God. Like you guys, I, I've been on three different continents. I've talked with people from dozens of different countries in this world about God. 
they all believe in God. There's a universal, yeah, there's some, something there. Only a fool says there's no God, okay? It doesn't take much to look out the window or at each other and look at creation and say, wow, there must be a creator, <laughs> right? There's got to be a God. Um, so we have this universal belief out there. Um, so man everywhere believes in the existence of some supreme being, um, in whom we are morally responsible. Most people know that. And that's why we can talk to people about Jesus Christ, about our sin problem, and about the need of a Savior, and what redemption is, and why the cross was needed, and why he rose from the dead, and how faith works, all that great stuff. But I want to consider with you guys first cause, okay? Cosmological uh, thought here, okay? So we know that every cause, that there's a corresponding effect right? Absolutely. That's just common sense. We can observe that. We know that. So likewise, every effect, there must exist a prior cause to that. Thus, mankind in creation is recognized as the effect springing, you know, springing from an ultimate first cause. Well, who's the first cause? God, okay? Just common sense. Um, I exist, I did not bring myself into existence. Someone else brought me into existence. This chain can go backwards until the first cause, right? That first cause would be God, right? Um, also, there's the evidence of design that we see. Um, teleological, the simple form or this argument could be uh, phrased as an analogy between, say, a world, um, the world and a clock. Okay? Even if one disbelieved in biblical account of creation, the intricacy that we see within the world, how everything is working together, that can't be by chance. There was a designer there, just like a watch. There's all these moving parts working together to make that work. Okay? So there is that understanding out there, intelligent design. Okay? Um, and again, I told you about the students down in Oshkosh, biology. Hey, there, there's a designer. We're, we're looking at this. If you get down to the base of who we are, the DNA, do you guys know how much information's in DNA? Where does that come from? Information just doesn't happen, okay? Someone had to code all of that. This is how you're going to work with this. You know, it's God. Also, there's the moral conscience, okay? I, I love... I love talking with people about this reality, especially with the atheist anthropology, okay, uh, anthropological. Um, man has an intellectual or moral nature. We know that. We know that stealing is wrong. We know lying is wrong. We know murdering is wrong. Where does that come from? How do we know deep down that those things are just wrong? How do we have a conscience about those things, Okay. Where does the yes in the no's or I ought or I ought not come from? Well, this implies the existence of some moral governor out there to whom we're responsible. Does that make sense? It's in us. And nobody's going to, like, even the creepiest people on this planet, <laughs> you know, if you talk about this with them, deep down they know what's right and wrong, Okay. Um, and then there's also the argument from uh, congruity. This is the belief in self-existence. So personal God is in harmony with all the facts of our mental and moral nature, as well as with uh, the you know, phenomenon of the natural world. So it just fits. And then the one that I love the most is what you guys are holding in your hands right now. Scriptural revelation. This is what I love. Okay. I trust the word of God with all of my being, every single word of it. Um, it assumes everything. I, I think it's cool. The Bible does not try to prove God's existence. Have you guys read that in the scriptures? Have you studied that? It just assumes God, God is. I love that about the Bible. And so many people want, well, how can you prove God? You know, well, we just know he's God, and that's how the scriptures, you know, assume from the very beginning, God, right? In the beginning, God. 
And something I love that I can know that this is God's word is fulfilled prophecy, guys. This is how we know it's true. It's supernatural. A lot of people want to make arguments. In the beginning, you're studying Genesis at Freedom Fellowship? What's your take on that? Do you really think this? Well, what about those people that think that? You know what? None of us were there. I don't care what they think. I don't care what you say. But I know the one who was there. And he's recorded what happened. Well, how can you take the Bible, his word, is being true, is being accurate. It's one thing I love about prophecy, guys. It's one thing that sets the Bible apart from every other book. Oh boy, I'm two minutes over. Um, mm-hmm. All right. Fulfilled prophecy. Okay. Oh, I don't have my mic on. Back to the seat. <laughs> I got four pages of notes left. Um, <laughs> we know there are 26 major religions in the world today. Okay, that would say, hey, our book, this revelation we have is divinely inspired. It's from God. You guys may recognize a few of these on the screen. Also, guys, when we consider the word of God, it's prophetic in nature. The Bible has hundreds and hundreds of fulfilled prophecies from hundreds. I mean, they were written hundreds of years beforehand, some even thousands Now, I want to go through just a few with you guys real quick concerning Jesus from the Old Testament. He'd be born of the seed of Abraham. He'd be born of the tribe of Judah. He of the house of David. Okay, He'd be born in the city of Bethlehem. Malachi told us he'd come while the temple's standing. You guys know that the temple isn't standing today? Jesus couldn't come today. When the prophecy is spoken, when God writes something, it happens exactly like he says. Prophecies aren't vague like so many other prophecies people get into. They're very specific. We're also told that he'd be born of a virgin in Isaiah. Isaiah told us that he would do miracles. We're told that Jesus would be rejected by his own people. Did that happen? Yeah. We're told in Daniel 9 the precise time in which Jesus would come to planet Earth. This is when your Savior is going to come. To the day. I think that's pretty cool. It's all laid out in Scripture. We're told that he would die. Really? God's going to come and die? Yeah, that's what the Bible tells us. And that he would rise from the dead. So when we consider prophecy, guys, the Bible's the only one that does it. Do you guys know that there's no other religious book out there that has fulfilled prophecy? Not one. In the Bible, which is 27% when it was written, predictive prophecy, so almost a third of the Bible, guys, is prophecy. We know that it's from God, that it is supernatural. Someone just coming and doing these few things, that's impossible. Okay? There's a mathematician by the name of Peter Stoner. He's a Russian dude. 1967, he wrote a book called Science Speaks. And he's a mathematician. He went through and did the math of just fulfilling these few prophecies. And there were over 300 concerning Christ's first coming. And do you guys know that there's 325 prophecies concerning the day he returns and eight times the amount of prophecy concerning the first time he came, like 2,400 something about the times that we'd be living in during the second coming of Christ. It's all over the Bible. God speaks more about today than even when he came 2,000 years ago. But this mathematician just went through just this handful the odds of one man fulfilling this, it's 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That would be 17 zeros behind it. That's crazy. Only the Bible does this, guys. All these prophecies were fulfilled. I love the passage that we find in Isaiah chapter 46. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, that would include what? The book of Genesis, right? Right? Things that are not yet done. And that would be things future. Prophecy. And you guys can go back and read the context around Isaiah's prophecy there in chapter 45. God actually challenges all other gods. If you're God, you foretell the future. He's like, you can't. I alone am able to tell the future. And this is how you're going to know that my word is true. It's supernatural. And that's why I can bank on what it says, guys. I wasn't there when creation happened, but I know the one who was. And I'm going to believe what he says. So, for time's sake, we're done. 
We're getting into God's creation the next time we get together. Um, this is really just an intro. I know we only got through really four words, I guess. <laughs> we will finish all of verse 1 the next time we get into Genesis, and I'm hoping to get all the way into chapter 3 with you guys in one study. So please read ahead. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your word that it can be trusted. God, I do pray. Lord, it's good to know these facts and truths. God, but unless we know you, unless we've believed on you with our heart, Jesus, God, it's going to mean nothing. I pray, Father, that people would be stirred up, especially those who don't believe, that they would see that you are God, that you love them. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for your word that is truth, that is able to set us free. And I want to see this body of believers be the freest people upon this planet, that we can just love you and love others and be free to do whatever you're asking of us, God. Use us, be glorified, we ask in your name. Amen.